Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Is this yours? Yes. 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 Alternativ dem Hausbescheid sagen halt nur nicht, ja, wir haben vorgestern vor um 14.30 Uhr ein Problem, können wir uns jetzt mal. Ja, ja, nee, das ist immer so direkt am besten. Aber wie gesagt, wir sitzen im alten Hochhaus, also wir brauchen jetzt 10 Minuten allein ein bisschen Also. Ja, weil oben sind auch Büros, das ist direkt IT von der UN zu folgen. Im letzten SP war ich mal irgendwo. Ja, wir sind so UN, aber das ist ja schon. Das ist UN zu folgen, oder? Nein, nein. Da sitzt keiner von uns weiter. Seid ihr immer im alten Hochhaus oder ist das jetzt wegen der Konferenz nicht Das ist jetzt während der Konferenz und leider bei dieser Konferenz, weil der Koch wird ja auch da oben sitzen, aber. Ich hatte bei mir nur ein Wahl. Ja, klar. Ihr müsst ja halt auch sofort, ne? Und dann müsst ihr halt immer rüber rennen. Richtig. Wie schlimmer ist, du rennst dann mit einem für die Sachen wie, ja, das Kabel funktioniert nicht. Das Kabel hängt nach vorne an der Wand. Achso, ja, das ist ein Kabel. Ja, richtig. Wie gesagt, wenn du möchtest, einfach. Welcome everyone, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming to our event. Um, we'll like to talk this afternoon. I'm Peter Minang from World Agroforestry Center in Nairobi. Um, we have uh, this event this afternoon is done by World Agroforestry Center, but there's also Oro Verde um, um, and Global Nature Fund from Germany. Both offices are based here in Bonn, so we're partnering together to run this, this event. Um, the event, as you saw, high impact public private climate finance, agroforestry case studies from Latin America and Africa. So we have a very, very interesting panel this afternoon to talk to you. 
um, about this to share some experiences. We know obviously that there are several of you in this room that are also very well experienced in this thing. So we're just sharing some experiences and then we'll give as much time as possible for discussions. So what we'll start off with is three presentations, two presentations from three presenters. Um, and then we'll have, once the presentations are done with, we'll have a panel um, that will constitute the three presenters plus two other panelists that we've invited. And I'll introduce them when the time comes for them to move up, up front and provide some comments for us, right? So without much ado, we'll start off, as you saw on the program, um, firstly, with a presentation from uh, Dr. Lalisa Duguma, who works uh, at ECRAF. He's a scientist uh, working with us. He does a lot of work on climate smart landscapes, but what he's known really for pioneering some work linking synergies between adaptation and mitigation in, 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 in climate smart landscapes. So Lalisa, over to you. Thank you. So uh, as uh, Peter has already said, I'll be talking very briefly about trees on farms as a pathway to achieve climate action commitments, I'm mainly focusing on what are the opportunities, the potentials, and the challenges. And this will be a very specific case study and also a very general kind of looking at the broader spectrum. But uh, in order to come to that, I think we need to recognize how agriculture, the food needs, the global human population, and all these things are linked together. And that is the starting point of where the world agroforestry begins. Because uh, we all know there used to be a large part of the globe as a forest, but it's being replaced due to agriculture and agriculture is expanding due to the need for food and the main issue which is of, of a big concern is the large part of expansion of agriculture is happening in the tropics which is estimated to be 80 percent currently and new crop lands are pushing the forest areas to be very small and recent estimates show that uh, we lose about five to 10 million hectares of forests due to the increasing food needs. But now the challenge and the question and one key issue that we need to articulate is, can we increase the food and energy supply without creating environmental damage? And that's where we need to come up with ideas which also link with the climate uh, commitment, climate action commitments. So this brings us to the issue of what is agroforestry? How many people really know agroforestry in this room? Can you raise up your hands? Agroforestry, what is agroforestry? How many people know? Okay, so I don't need to go into the details because large majority of the audience knows. So agroforestry is a practice of combining trees and livestock into the farming system. And it's a kind of very uh, traditional practice. In some instances, there are some innovations coming up and it's believed to be one of the best ways of linking farmers to the climate actions, because that's what they do in the tropics and subtropics. They practice that a lot. As I said earlier, the big challenge we have is, if you look at this graph, it's not really well done, but it gives a lot of very crucial information. And look at this, for example, rubber, where are the new lands for, the new land for these commodity crops are coming from? And most of them actually are coming from forests. And that's where the concern is. And we have the red plus agenda, which is very big. And in order to reduce that pressure on the forests, which is happening due to the various needs of wood and fuel and all those things, we need a system that can bring back the wood that can actually subsidize the wood need. Maybe you are familiar with this forest transition curve where you start with a huge 
potential for carbon sequestration because it's a primary forest. It will be logged, it goes down, it's converted into a cropland. And then we have this situation where the carbon stock begins to grow because we have trees coming back into the system through agroforestry. That's why trees on farms actually play a major role in bringing back the tree component of the landscapes. And that's where the emphasis of uh, most of my speech will be. To highlight this, I'll use the coffee case study from Ethiopia. Coffee grows in three different forms in Ethiopia. There is a wild coffee, which is wild by nature. Nobody grows, but it is there. So you can go collect and make coffee. And there are about 500 varieties in one place in South Ethiopia. This is a wild coffee forest. This is a semi-forest coffee agroforestry, which almost looks like a forest, but it's an agroforestry where coffee trees, if you see here, you see some red things. These are coffee berries, and it's a co semi-forest coffee. And we have this home garden agroforestry coffee system where coffee is combined with different types of tree species. So when you look at the canopy, you sometimes feel it is a forest, but it is not a forest. It's an agroforest. And this thing actually is not part of the discourse in the climate actions because there was no clear methodology how to bring these kinds of systems to be accounted for in the Red Plus agenda, for instance, which I'll come to it later. What are the potentials? Uh, I'll discuss this step by step. The first one is how agroforestry can actually reduce deforestation. Why does deforestation happen? Because people need wood and if you grow trees and combine trees into the farming system, you can actually reduce that extent of deforestation because you now have trees that can supply that wood that you need. And the second scenario is the degradation aspect. Why do people go into the forest to collect fuel wood? If we can supply fuel wood from the trees, which are in, from those that are in the farms, we don't have degradation happening. So these are two big mechanisms, and this graph actually gives you the hint of what can happen with the red plus mechanism if we can actually bring on board this agroforestry in an extensive way where it is possible to do it. There are many indirect benefits of trees on farms. When I say trees on farms, it's just referring to agroforestry. So there are a number of studies, but I just picked a few of them. For instance, there was a study done by ECRAFT scientists where they proved actually just by pruning trees on the farms in one part of Kenya, using it very efficiently with a gasifier cook stoves can suffice the energy needs of households. This is a big thing because they don't have to go to the forest to cut fuel wood, but you reduce the time they need to go to the forest especially the ladies and children, because that's where the big heavy task lies. And they will have more time for other activities. So you reduce deforestation and forest degradation. This is a proven thing. The next thing, just from a, derivative, a kind of derivative from this, uh, this statement, it reduces the cooking time from 19 to 23%. This is a big social value for ladies especially in the developing world. And it reduces emission by 40 to 90%. This is a big shift because there is a lot of smoke coming out, wood burned and all those things, reduced emission. When you have trees in the system, you increase soil carbon where you have a huge carbon mass. Where, and that happens through the organic matter that comes into the soil plus the reduced erosion because with time you reduce actually because tree roots actually keep the soil in place this is a very obvious fact uh, there was 
study done by ECRAF scientists last year, I think in 2016, is published in Nature Scientific uh, Reviews. They have shown that 43% of all agricultural lands in the world have at least 10% tree cover. But these are not part of either the discussions in the red plus or any other mechanism. And this total area, the 43%, they actually sequestered 45.3 gram carbon as a whole. And majority of this comes from the tree component, more than 75%. And if you look at the agricultural land, you have about 0.75 gigatons of carbon dioxide globally sequestered over a year in the last decade. This is a big thing. I mean, when we talk about the carbon figures, these are big numbers. And there is interesting fact, forests are decreasing, but trees on farms are actually increasing. Between uh, 2000 and 2010, they increased by 3.7%. There is an increasing trend of people picking up that mechanism. So it's good. These are lots of benefits, but what are the challenges? Okay, I'll manage. Look at this thing. This side is Kenya. This part is Tanzania. And this is the international border. This is just copied from Google Earth. And you see what is here, and you see what is here. This is happening just because of policy difference. And people here have adopted boundary, boundary tree planting and different kinds of keeping trees on farms. But here you see a bare land, which is completely farmed again and again, but there is no tree that you can significantly even count. So, we need the right policy in place. Why do farmers in Tanzania do it? While those farmers in Kenya with the same context, agroclimatically and whatever, they don't do the same thing. And this is a very critical part, which actually relates to the financing component. When you think about a plot of agroforestry, you need time. I mean, you need to make investment because you need to grow the seedlings and all those things. And this is the part. Until it comes to the point where the balance is zero, you are losing. But think about a smallholder farmer in the tropics who is very poor, who has the land, but who has no money, and who just wants to do this thing, but he has no resource. How can he cover this part? And then we have this part where it actually becomes producing net positive results. So that's why we need to think about how can a public financing mechanism here mobilize this whole chain, which actually has a lot of benefits in a wider context. That's why I'm just raising this issue of blended finance, but what is the modality that is appropriate in a given context? That's what needs to be properly articulated. Global agreements, a lot of them, and the two key issues are the accounting problem. As I said, this carbon stock from on-farm trees is not part of the discussion largely. It's recently that there is a mechanism developed, not a mechanism, but a methodology to capture this kind of carbon stock from on-farm trees, but even now it is not very well uh, designed. And the other issue is I showed you the coffee, the different coffee growing schemes, but can those ones qualify as a forest if you take different definitions? They can, but we don't have a standard definition of forest that can capture these kinds of mechanisms, that these kinds of practices. When is a forest a forest to qualify for red plus? So I think you might have gotten a number of questions, but that's my task because I need you to ask a lot of issues and we need to reflect on it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Alisa. I think we can. 
Thank you very much, Lalisa. I think we can take one or two questions of clarification really short, not more than 30 seconds, please. So we've got two first. If you have any, please write it down when the next, after the next presentation, then we'll come back to it. I know it's your question, yeah? So we'll come back to you, please. So just two quick questions of clarification. And Lalisa, if you can have a very short response as well. Hello, yeah? Oh, I'm Marilyn Hedger from the Overseas Development Institute. I currently work on climate finance, but um, not so long ago, I did my thesis on agroforestry systems looking at fieldwood production in, in Ecuador, in cocoa and coffee systems. And what I found was there was a lot of natural regeneration of trees within those systems. You, you're not necessarily having to do seed planting. Have you looked at that in, in any detail? Or have the seed banks gone in the, in the soils? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I I didn't get uh, this idea of 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 boost private investment. Can you enlarge a bit a bit again? Who, whose investment is is to be leveraged? The the, the investment of the of this of the farmer in, indeed. I I didn't get the, the idea of this blended finance. Mm -hmm. it's very very quickly and very short. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, the soil seed bank and this potential for regeneration. I mean, even agroforestry is called the refugia of threatened species because if you look at the southern Ethiopian context, we have a lot of these threatened species which are over harvested, but they are still existing in the agroforestry system. There are lots of studies that have captured that, but we can chat because I know some specific studies which looked at those particular cases. And whose financing should be leveraged? At, for us, smallholder farmers are private sector investors. So they should be the, those kinds of investments should be the ones to be leveraged because now there are lots of things, regulatory, in a, I mean, that are imposed on different investment mechanisms, which are not really, when you really scrutinize it, it's not fair when you impose on a smallholder who really is going to do something that benefits not only his household, but the global population or wider community. We can have a chat on this too, because it's, we have a broader discussion from different examples. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dalisa. Thanks. We'll come back to you with the questions. Now we've got a, um, and I go back to your last, the last question. We have people in this room that really know about the financing, big time. Um, Tosten, we have two presenters in our next presentation. They'll present together. Um, Tosten Klimpel works for Oro Verde, which is the German Tropical Forest Foundation. He's worked in the last six years in Latin America on conservation, mm -hmm. on finance issue. How do you finance conservation? Looking at participatory approaches. So he will talk a lot on that. And then we have uh, Andrea Paifa, who is a project manager at the Global Nature Fund, which is an international foundation for environment and nature. And she's worked a lot also with private companies, the private sector, trying to get them to work on biodiversity, to finance biodiversity, and, and to integrate those good practices within their businesses, especially natural capital accounting practices. So these two people really know and spend a lot of time on the financing side and private sector sides of things. So they'll talk to you a little bit. Thanks a lot. Over to you, please. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for the introduction, Peter, and well, thank you for the question. I, I think it was a good question to introduce my my subject. Um, I will talk about private capital to finance forest and biodiversity conservation. About a case study analysis we did together with the Global Nature Fund of different investments in biodiversity conservation. 
Um, this was a project financed by the um, Federal Ministry of Environment and the Federal Agency of Conservation. Let's start with our first slide about what's the status of ca private capital for conservation. Um, what you first can see, we have a strong increase. Um, it's important that's just the average across all years. So in 2004, we have um, 0 0.2 billion dollars investing in, in conservation, and it's strongly increased to 2015. Um, there were two, two billion US dollar investing in conservation. This, this um, numbers are taken from a study from ecosystem marketplaces, um, which was um, published last year. The different colors means um, the blue one are all the investment in, in water quality and quantity. Um, the green one are the investment in, in conservation um, of natural habitats, for example, um, habitat banking, but also um, the, um, the carbon trade um, is part of this investment. And finally, the, the big one are also the investment in, in, in sustainable food and fiber production, um, specifically in, 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 in natural forest management or forest management and also in agriculture. This is the, the most biggest part of, of, of this um, investment. Agroforestry, I think we can put in, in the, the brown one. Um, later we will give more example about this. So what was interesting for us was what are the, the impacts of these investments um, in for forest and biodiversity conservation? We used this definition of the Global Impact Investing Network um, about impact investment. What does it mean? It means first there have to be any financial return for the private investor. <laughs> This means uh, preservation of capital to market return and there have to be a positive measurable impact. That's very important. It couldn't be just um, a byproduct of the investment, it have to be in the main focus of the investment. There can be any ecological impact, social impact or both of this investment. Um, we used um, the following model of the analysis of the different investment. In the blue circle, you see the, the, the typical financial investment. There you have an, an investor, could be public or private, invest in some kind of investment vehicle. And then there's a due diligence process, which includes some criteria of ecological or social criteria to select the capital recipient. And the capital recipient have to cause some positive ecological and social impact. And of course, there have to be any return generation from, from the capital recipient, for example, by selling some products like coffee, for example, or wood, and generating a financial return to the private investor. As I mentioned before, there have to be monitoring and reporting system. And as in, in normal investments, there are risk. Um, maybe there could be higher risk by investing uh, for example, in, in Latin American countries or in African countries. Um, so let's start with, with the first part, investor. Um, in the impact investor, um, you have, well, here are the very impact oriented um, parts. It's a philanthropy, it's more like a donation uh, without any interest of financial return. And here on the other side, on the y axis, you have the solely profit in investing investor. They, they, they look on the financial return and the impact investor, uh, both of this. Um, they don't look only on the impact, they want some financial return, but always with the objective to get any ecological um, or social impact. Um, in the analysis we did, there uh, were several investors, a lot of development banks and sorry, investing in this area. For example, the European Investment Bank, also the um, uh, IADB is investing a lot in this area. Um, there are some foundation, specifically, for example, the, the Rockefeller Foundation um, is investing a lot of money in, 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 in the social part, social impact investing. Um, banks and in Germany, for example, the, the GLS Bank is participating in, in impact investing but also some small retail investor and enterprises. All of them with different interests, but 
um, linking both the financial return and um, the invest the impact of the investment. So these are the investment vehicle we we found that are at the moment have some investment specifically in, in biodiversity conservation. Um, there's increasing number of bonds, the, 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 the brown one, but at the moment there are a lot of investments in renewable energy and not so much in, in the um, conservation area. There are a lot of funds, different types of fund, hybrid funds, equity funds, um, there are also a new mechanism that's called conservation note um, from, from, for example, Nature Conservancy. We also include cooperative. It's not a typical investment vehicle, but we found it's an interesting mechanism to channel the resources of retail investors um, for, for, for um, impact investment. Um, so some direct investment specifically to a project and also um, depending on the investor of the interest of the investor. The next part are the smallholder we, we, we looked on um, of different um, the investments. Um, we, we only took five of them and we, we went there on field and, and um, looked how, how are the impacts in, on ground. Um, they have different kinds of investment vehicle. Um, for example, where the venture fund, um, a capital or loan orientated fund, who's in doing investment in cooperative and also in small and medium enterprises. Um, you can see it here on the, on the picture. For example, investment in, in a small coffee um, farm. Another one was investment we, we, we looked at the um, cooperative Oiko Credit, who is investing in a microfinance institute called um, Aldea Global in, in Nicaragua. Um, so we have microfinance institute like a capital recipient, and then you have smallholders receiving the, the money. And there are other kinds of investment focused on um, small and medium enterprises, for example, um, the investment of Waldmenschen AG, it's, it's a German um, enterprise or cooperative investing in, in Futuro Forestal. Um, in Panama, you have Wong Group, where you have a direct investment in natural forest management. And another category is here the Eco Enterprise Fund investing in rainforest expedition. It's important to mention that we just look on one project of bigger portfolio and due to time and money. It was just possible to go to visit only one project. In the case of Verde Venture, we, we visit five different coffee farms. Um, so the impact that are caused due to this investment we, we saw there uh, in, in some areas, they preserved natural forest, um, they used native species, they reduced use of um, pesticide and fertilizer, this is normally linked to certification they, they implemented. They reduced some poaching and illegal, illegal lodging, and they increased the species diversity. And in the social part, they pay generally living wages. Um, they generate employment. Cooperatives uh, have higher social impact than um, the medium enterprises by um, employment generation and also to include the local communities. There was some kind of health improvements due to um, constructing hospitals and capacity building was normally linked to the part of the uh, occupational safety. So these are some of the impacts. Um, not all are caused by the investment, but by the money they received say in uh, maybe they enhanced or they could um, stay there and um, reduce some pressure for example to to um, hot spots areas high biodiversity areas so now we come to specific example because today we are talking about agroforestry so i would like to talk a little bit about the investment of the verde venture fund who specifically invest in coffee farms here you see that's now we have the verde venture fund the public and private capital that goes in was around 40% um, private capital and 60% of public money um, goes in the Verde Venture Fund. They have a portfolio of 50 different projects um, with an amount of around 23 million US dollars. 
They give loans to coffee farmers um, from 10,000 to 500,000 US dollars. And then they use this normally for pay the worker during the harvest season and maintain some certification schemes. And then they have impacts um, by maintaining agroforestry system in this area and also by um, have some health improvement. The interest rate on the loan was between 10 to 11 percent and the interest rate um, was between 1 to 10 percent depends on the investor. For example, there was one private investor, Starbucks, who have a um, specific interest investing in, in, in agroforestry system and also implementing the best practice Starbucks um, certification. So there were different kind of internal rate of return. The monitoring was done on field by some external universities, but more about the interest of the university than of the fund. The, the own value venture fund is rated by IRIS. It's a mechanism or standard for impact investment and it also by um, certified or right by BLAB. Um, risk, there are a lot. Interesting for me is that currency risk are transmitted to the coffee farmer by giving the loan in US dollar. Um, in, in Guatemala and Mexico, all the currency risk are taken by the coffee farmer. So here are the example of the impacts. You can see there are a lot of difference. We saw this nice slides from Larissa, where you have a lot of trees and <laughs> the same you can see in, in two coffee farms, Finca Landa and Cooperative Comunianop de Pic. But this depends really on the owner of this farmer. They implemented this um, high diverse um, agroforestry system. And on the other hand side, you have Finca like Monte Grande or Hamburgo or Los Andes, which are more monoculture, but they received the same loan with the same condition. They have some certification, but not the same standard like Finca Elanda, which has a Demeter certification. So there are a lot of difference of the same investment, but on the impact on the ground. So now we, we're coming to the results um, of, of the, all, the whole study. This was just one specific example, which will present there. Thank you, Thorsten. Um, so as Thorsten already mentioned, um, this is one example of our five case studies. And we also conducted some expert interviews to get an overview of impact investments and their impact on biodiversity. So let me start with some positive outcomes of our study. Um, first of all, that's what Thorsten already <laughs> mentioned. Um, there is an increased demand from the private sector and to invest in impact investments for biodiversity even for biodiversity conservation, even if it's a niche market, but there is an increased demand. And um, um, this gives the impact investment also the possibility to raise awareness of the, impact, the private investors that there is a necessity to invest in biodiversity conservation in agroforestry systems. And um, furthermore, every investment has an impact but for most of the investment you don't know what kind of impact is it a positive is it a negative what are the investments and for impact investments you have a good <laughs> alternative to traditional investments because you know that these investments are established to have a positive impact <clears throat> A further positive um, uh, an advantage of these impact investments is that they promote sustainable businesses, business models and industries. And for in the, from the viewpoint of the capital recipients, they provide an, or improve the access to capital and markets. As um, Thorsten said, the, the credit conditions are not that good, that some um, marketing conditions, but they have the chance to get a credit. And that's not normal for all the smallholders. So this is a really advantage to improve the access to capital and even to markets when the investment um, pools resources and provides an um, access. And an uh, and further positive um, outcome is that the impact investments enhance um, certifications like for Stewardship Council, um, Rainforest Alliance, um, 
fair trade and so on. But um, besides these positive um, outcomes, there are some challenges and I would like to um, show you some of them. Um, the first is we have a definition of impact investments. These investments are um, established to have a positive impact and a measurable <laughs> impact. But until now, um, most of the investments implement an extensive due diligence process to select the projects they want to invest in, but um, they do not have a monitoring, they do not measure the impact, and um, they imply due to their due diligence process that there is a positive impact, but they can't prove it. And um, until now, this is really a big challenge because it costs money to monitor the impact and the investors um, expect a high return. So this is challenging for the investments. Um, then um, what we found out is that most of the investments invest in existing projects. Um, they, it's too risky to establish new ones, so they use existing um, project businesses with established um, um, structures. And the problem here we see is on the one hand that um, the, the local <laughs> impact you can have on biodiversity conservation um, is limited because you, you um, support existing projects um, that can increase a bit, but you're not um, establishing a new one. And the second problem is that um, there's an increasing demand and it's getting harder and harder to find existing projects that are investable. And um, so this is the next challenge for the um, impact investment. And as we mentioned before, um, the impact measurement is missing. Um, this has several reasons. I um, already told you that um, it's really costly to implement this. Another aspect is that there is no international accepted standard who helps um, to, to know what kind of indicators could I use to um, measure my impact. And um, the indicators that, that are developed um, right now are not practical to do this. So there's a really a challenge for the investments um, to implement this impact measurement. Another challenge we see is that um, there are positive um, ecological and social impacts um, through the um, investments and they have the potential to reduce the risk for the investor and for the investment vehicle. And until now they are not able to, to include, to consider this risk reduction, reduction potential um, in their risk assessment. And um, we think this is really important to do this, um, to, to um, attract more private investors when they uh, are able to assess the risk, um, then they would invest more. And um, a further challenge is the missing track record. Um, we see this in the renewable energy sector. Um, this attracts more and more money because they trust in the investments <laughs> that they will work, that the return will be um, generated. And here this is a young market, a niche market, and um, the track record is missing, um, but um, we, have the, uh, we hope that this will change. Okay, so um, these are some of the results and now um, what are our recommendations? Um, what do you think, um, how we could enhance the impact of, the, of such investments? Um, first, um, some um, recommendations for the investors. Mm, what needs to be supported is the capacity building because we need to increase the number of investable projects um, and this could be done through the impact investment, but also outside of the investment through government supporting programs. Then um, a next important um, um, yeah, recommendation is that there must be ecological and social mi minimum requirements for such um, <laughs> investments. And this is not only important for the public investor who has to justify the participation in such investment schemes um, to the social society, to the society, but this is also um, important for 
um, the, the selection process. So you can find an, an effective investment um, when you have such um, requirements and you can show the advantage um, over traditional investments even more if you can um, if you have such um, social and um, ecological minimum requirements. Um, then what I said before, um, there is a risk reduction potential and we think it's it's um, uh, crucial that this is analyzed and that that is considered in the risk assessment and therefore we need um, more research there. And um, a last um, important point for the investor is that um, we need to analyze the effect of public capital. Um, this is used to, to attract private capital and um, as a risk buffer and it, uh, the, the, it should uh, leverage the investment. But until now, it's not clear how much <laughs> public money do you need and how long do you need it in these investments. And um, to, to increase the effectiveness of such investments, this um, effect of public um, capital should be analyzed more. So then we have some require, uh, recommendations for the investment vehicles um, to increase their impact. Um, first is to establish um, the monitoring system, as we um, said already said. Um, then an um, important point Torsten already mentioned is that um, the loans should be um, offered in local currencies to reduce the risk for the, um, for the capital recipients. And um, the next point is to enhance the capacity building. This um, an example is to, to help the, the capital recipients to um, obtain certifications and, um, and further to, to um, improve their management skills for, <laughs> for small farmers. And another thing is to raise more awareness about um, the value of sound ecosystems in the local community. It's not only the one capital recipient who needs to be convinced that this is important for, for um, him um, to have um, sound ecosystems. It's also important for the local community. And, and a further point, um, Torsten already mentioned, um, the positive impact um, we, we um, have from the investments. It's not due to the investment, it's um, um, conducted by the, or it's, um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's not from the investment, it's from the, the capital recipient itself. And this comes from the, the existing um, structures you're investing in. But um, furthermore, you can see is for the cooperatives that they really have an, a special effort to increase the impact and to include the local community. And um, a last point is um, that Thorsten already mentioned this before, um, there are several um, projects that are funded by an investment, but they, the credit conditions do not reflect the positive ecological and social impact these um, capital recipients have. And we think um, if the um, investment, this is a good opportunity for the investment to create incentives to increase the impact and um, credit conditions um, should reflect this. And this is also um, when you implement a monitoring system, you have a clear um, view on this and this is an important instrument um, we think that should be used. So I think that's um, it. Many thanks for your attention and if there are any questions, we are happy to answer. Thank you. Very, very, very much on time. One minute less than the allocated time. So perfect. Thank you. Um, any questions of clarification from them? Two questions or three questions? Just to clarify, and then we open it up. We bring the panelists on, and we open it up. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes, just. Nice catch, thank you. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, um, can thank you. Can you just say your name, please? My name is Chaba. Affiliation. Yeah. And I'm from Hungary. Yes. Uh, well, um, it was really interesting, all these uh, aspects related to financing. 
um, agroforestry mainly or any other ecosystem-based um, investment. It was to, to my greatest surprise that, well, investors look for, for such a high interest rate on, uh, on all their investments. Uh, and they invest only in existing projects, you, you said. But the, the number of existing projects are decreasing. How do you say what are the results on the investor side, whether they, they are willing to invest for a lower profit or they, they leave the area and go for a, for, and look for another business on, 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 on any other areas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question, please. You want to take one or two, yeah? And then, we, and then you can respond. Any questions of clarification? Hanging on, you wanted to ask a question, but that was that to the first presenter? No, sorry, madam. Yes, ma'am. You wanted to ask a question. Is it to them or to the first presenter? Yeah, please. Thank you very much for a kind of opportunity to give them to me. Yes, uh, I would like to ask to the uh, Mr. Larissa about uh, he, on his presentation. Uh, I'm Yasko from Renewa, uh, International Renewable Energy Agency. So he presented about the uh, Gashifa cook stove, which is a uh, uh, very good uh, in, uh, in terms of the place of three sto stoves and uh, reduce <laughs> use of wood and cooking time. Uh, could you please elaborate a bit more about uh, so what the uh, Gashifa stove looks like? like uh, so it is uh, using biomass or animal manure or etc. So the other one question is about you also presented about uh, the border between Tanzania and Kenya is very different and uh, so Tanzania policy is the matter and uh, I would like to know a little bit more about uh, what uh, Tanzania's policy is uh, affect in, impact have bring about a good impact like subsidies or punishment or it is it thank you very much okay thanks a lot um Lalisa so you hold that once they finish then you can you can speak a little bit please gentlemen yeah <clears throat> hello everyone my name is juan carlos hintiach i am sure indigenous from rainforest of ecuador i belong to coica umbrella amazon indigenous organization from amazon basin thank you very much for your presentation it's very very interesting but i would like you can give me some more uh, information about how you are coordinated about our or perspectives or indigenous people who we are working because we have our own systems of agroforestry and the challenge is also to uh, certification because this is cost a lot of money but we have our own organic system and knowledge and we are fighting here for the platform also under UNCC and finances also is a challenge for everybody but mm -hmm. I would like to see because you were talking about how you are coordinated with some communities or right, because we are very very interested in the Amazon basin about this and this is our topic in our table because we have a, under a lot of pressure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Any last questions for clarification? And then we open it up to the to the panel. Okay. Good. So, who's going to take those? Um, you ask about the the high return expectation of of the investors. I agree with you. There's a lot of return expectation and um, it depends um, on the investor type. Um, in the case of Oiko Credit, there you have retail investors, they accept, they most more have social um, <laughs> um, goals by their investment or ecological goals, they accept um, all the returns from 2%. Um, but the, the typical, I don't know if it exists a typical investor, but who normally is on, on investing like the high net worth individual who is investing in, in other sectors, I, I don't feel that there's such an interest to accept a lower return. Um, and we, we went in a lot of events and conference and there's a NGOs, there's a public sector, um, but we was always missing the finance sector in this area in this event. So it's maybe one of the big challenge, how to attract um, the private investors to accept lower return generation, um, or how you 
can enhance the return. It's also an uh, interesting point because by selling just products or coffee, it will be very um, difficult by including ecological or social return, for example, linking it to some payment for ecosystem services or to, to Red Plus, it could be one possibility to get a little bit high return, but not not competitive to, to the market return. Yeah, I think um, Torsten mentioned everything. Um, then to the second um, question regarding the to finance the certification. Um, I think one good example is their <laughs> Aldea Global um, that um, is a cooperative that um, um, supports its um, members in, in obtaining certifications, international accepted certifications, but they also um, established an own um, standard and um, this is only sold in this local market. And in the local market or in the region, they know this um, certification and um, this is a way to, it ha has nearly the same um, um, requirements than international accepted um, standards, but um, it's not that cost intensive um, like an, an Ford Stewardship Council or something like that. So this is a way for Idea Global to support um, the, the members and to increase the impact, but um, to, that the costs are not too high. That's one solution, yeah. Lalisa, can you provide quick clarifications and then we go to the panel. Can we give a hand to uh, Justin and Andrea, please? Lovely, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Just some quick clarifications and then we can follow up our panel. So, uh, the, the question about the gasifier cook stove, yes, it uses biomass. That's why we try to link it to the agroforestry case because the pruning from the trees that will be grown in the farms provides the wood that is required for that cook stove. So it's a kind of using the wood from the farms, not from the forest, and you enhance the energy effectiveness by using efficient stove. That's why the gasifier cook stove is actually preferred because it has higher thermal efficiency compared to other existing cook stoves at the affordable level of price. Uh, the difference between Kenya and Tanzania is something we are still exploring, but what I can tell you is it's definitely related to the policy issues. But the, because there is a lot of dynamics in terms of policies between the two, I mean, even in Tanzania, whenever there is some change in government, as you know, there is some change in the land tenure because this link is basically with the tenure structure. Because if you don't have the tenure security, you don't trust to plant or to invest in growing trees on your farm. So there are lots of complicated issues there, but we'll come up with answers in the future. But for now, it is a tenure related issue which needs to be explored further. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Alisa. Um, we will we'll now get some reflections from two, you know, well-known people who've been partly linked to this, but who've been thinking about this also over time. So we'll have our first uh, panelist. It's Mr. Christian Grossheim. He's from the Federal Agency for Nature Conservation. Uh, in the Department of uh, Forestry. You can see their agency was partly responsible for funding this. Um, and he's worked a lot, he's overseen a lot of foreign projects on foreign investments, you know, in, 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 in nature conservation, but also on, on Red Plus, and has been instrumental in securing some funding for this kind of, this kind of work. So we, we are really grateful, uh, uh, Mr. Grossheim, for for taking your time to come here and talk to us a little bit. Um, our next panelist is uh, Dr. George Wamukoya. Um, George is a negotiator with the African group, and he's been very instrumental over the last few years talking about agriculture, agroforestry within the climate change discussions. Um, George has been 
I think from when I got to know him, like how many years ago, eight or nine. <laughs> he's been he's been a big champion of saying agriculture and agroforestry has to be part of the, the discussions. We've been in the fight together, but George, most importantly, has been is a very renowned environmental lawyer that worked a lot on all most of the current legislation in Kenya on conservation and things like that. So he comes from that background and, and we like them to just reflect a little bit, maybe three minutes, four minutes each, um, maybe to think about for uh, uh, Christian, maybe think, talk to us about what, how you see these sorts of, you know, projects, the results that you've seen today, how does that help fit into the policy arena? And how do you think that will move things forward in terms of conservation, in terms of uh, environmental services and things like that? So maybe just some reflections based on what you've seen today. Three, four minutes? Yes, you can just yeah good afternoon everybody it's a pleasure for me to be here and to have the chance to to uh to respond after uh two very very good uh, presentations here um yeah to start with i should probably introduce what the federal agency for nature conservation really is because i guess that most of you don't really know we are a departmental research agency that reports to the german federal ministry of environment um and we are the German government's scientific authority with res responsibility to national and international nature conservation. <laughs> so this is probably um, yeah, where it all starts or where our responsibility comes in. Um, we, if we are funding a project, we always need something like a, a, a government's interest into the, into the project and to, to use it as a justification for the finance. Uh, and in this case, um, since we are from the nature conservation side, we are looking more on the CBD issues. Even if we are here in the UNFCCC now, but we are approaching the issue rather from the, from the CBD side. And you have the IG biodiversity targets, or you have the strategic goals which uh, say you have to address the underlying causes of biodiversity loss. And in Cancun, the decision was taken about mainstreaming biodiversity in, in, in different sectors. And this is somehow fitting in there. It's also fitting in uh, in reducing the direct pressures on biodiversity and, and promote sustainable use, because this is what you're doing with agroforestry and with these financial uh, uh, models. Uh, you try to impulse or to, to push somehow uh, the sustainable use and sustainable development. And there is uh, uh, specifically in under the strategic goal B, uh, two targets, target seven and target 11, which say that the areas under agriculture should be managed sustainably. This is one uh, uh, IG biodiversity target and target eight says that the pollution and even this includes the excess of nutrients should be brought to levels that are not detrimental uh, to environmental services. And this is also something that you can uh, probably better achieve using agroforestry than uh, uh, highly intensified uh, uh, agricultural models. And uh, how does it fit in into the climate context? I, I mean, from my point of view, it's all, all so obvious because agroforestry and, and these models are climate smart because you're protecting soils, you are uh, uh, conserving carbon stocks, uh, you are uh, even improving carbon stocks here. I mean, it's, uh, it's not uh, um, that you are harvesting everything after one year, it's perennial uh, uh, crops. Uh, you have the, the trees inside the system, which are uh, uh, carbon reservoirs, and which can, after using the trees, can still be, uh, the carbon is still stored in a, in a, in a wood product and is not released into the atmosphere. So it's, uh, uh, I think it's, it's exactly this link between uh, the, the CBD and the, and the UNFCCC, uh, and we see it here. Agri agriculture is, uh, I think we agree on that, is highly disputed uh, currently here. If we should include mitigation aspects, only focus on food security and adaptation of uh, production systems, this is uh, uh, an ongoing discussion currently here. And uh, this is uh, how it all fits in, from my point of view. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian. Really good points. I think I think that really really fits in, really well. And that leads us really in a nice sequel into George's uh, reflections. I think George, 
as I said, has been in the negotiations, and we thought that he can sort of shed some light on what he's heard and how does that fit directly into where agriculture is going in the current negotiations here and, 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 and in the future. George, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Uh, thanks, colleagues, for a very, very uh, insightful presentations. Very useful. Yeah, in terms of um, agriculture um, and agroforestry, uh, I think it's very clear that uh, agroforestry has uh, a lot of space in agriculture uh, in the basis, on the basis that we're discussing. One, assuming that we take the, the, the convention and we're looking at Article 2 of the convention, where you should not threaten the food production, and also, if you're looking at Article 2.1b uh, of the Paris Agreement, again, where you're increasing the ability to adapt and fostering climate resilience and low uh, carbon uh, without compromising uh, the, the quality in terms of food uh, production, it, it, it's very critical that uh, you look at it from two perspectives. One, that um, food production is a primary the primary goal and in that aspect uh, from african perspective you'll be looking at the adaptation and livelihood issues <laughs> and the agricultural landscapes have uh, increasingly in the normal settings of the african uh, agriculture you hardly find a farmer who's just doing a uh, just growing a crop and doesn't have any need, any tree or a different uh, or whatever nature. Uh, and therefore, agroforestry has become part and parcel of the African landscape for a number of reasons. One is that uh, increasingly they are not able to get the firewood they used to get because the forests used to be there. Now they are no longer there. And, and so having woodlots or uh, some, some form of a perennial uh, crop uh, either as a woodlot or on the fences, as was shown, uh, becomes a very important uh, uh, source of uh, fuel, which you, you which you are saying in in terms of cooking stoves and uh, and, and uh, the energy. In addition, many of the crops, and, and I think this where the ICRAF and other institutions that are dealing with agroforestry have been very useful, in that they have tried to work on uh, various crops uh, and, and trees that are. Are, uh, are multifaceted where they produce uh, uh, fruits or, or other source of, uh, of food. And so they supplement uh, some of the, of the de deficiencies that uh, communities may have in terms of food. Uh, but more importantly, uh, from a climate angle, uh, the, 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 the agroforestry plays a very critical role, as uh, Christian has said, that they store carbon. Uh, and, and one of the key things that is critical uh, is how we stabilize the, 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 the soils in such a manner that uh, they are able to store as much carbon as possible. And, and, and so in, in, in the <laughs> negotiations, that's how what uh, the other parties look at as, as, uh, as co-benefits, mm -hmm. uh, because they, they try to avoid to use the, the word mitigation, but essentially that's what it means. And for, for, for if you look at the in terms of where we are and where we are going, it, it, it will be interesting to, 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 to look at the, the NDCs of the parties. Because if you look at the NDCs of the parties, uh, in, all, in all respects, you'll find that uh, they, they are saying agriculture is important in the adaptation, but also in many of them are saying agriculture is important in the mitigation. And when you're looking at agriculture, you have to look at it in the context that agroforestry is part of the agriculture, because in, our, in most of our landscapes, uh, agroforestry is, 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 is practiced uh, together with, uh, with, uh, with agriculture. The challenge we have is this. In adaptation, parties have not yet clarified how they are going to achieve building of resilience. What are they going to do with the agriculture sector in order to enhance uh, resilience? 
climate resilient over time. And that's an area that the scientists who are here will be interested to see how do you work with countries to be able to further clarify the NDCs on the role of agroforestry in enhancing adaptation. And then you can actually reverse that and also ask, because parties have also in the NDCs indicated that agroforestry or agriculture is going to be a solution or contribute towards uh, mitigation, then the question is, how should countries elaborate their, uh, their NDCs for purposes of demonstrating how they are going to achieve or agroforestry is going to achieve uh, or help them achieve the ambition that they have set out for. Just to give you an example, Kenya, where, where I come from, uh, the, the, the NDC says we're going to reduce emission by 30%. Now, that percent, <coughs> agriculture and agroforestry appears in both adaptation and mitigation but they have not elaborated how they are going to move from what they have indicated on paper to the actual delivery of the emission reduction by 30%. And I think that is what the challenge that many countries are facing. The second one is the question of uh, MRV, uh, the, 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 the measurement uh, uh, verification and reporting, or the vice versa. It's, it's, it's very critical because agroforestry plays a very critical role in building resilience. How do we measure the contribution of agroforestry in building resilience or adaptation? I'm sure scientists are here. That's, that's a question that already within the, the negotiations we're asking, and I think we want Substa to try and uh, look at that question. How do we the metrics for measuring adaptation and resilience so that we are able to track that if we are saying that agroforestry is contributing or is going to be one of the methods by which we are going to increase the ability to uh, adapt and build resilience, then we should be able to track that. Whereas on the other side, I think it's much clearer uh, because of mitigation is much clearer the methods are well known and therefore it's possible to measure. But in total, you need to demonstrate that uh, the, 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 the value to which adaptation, the, the value to which agroforestry contributes towards uh, uh, adaptation is very, very important because you may miss it and yet it is the main component that, that, that makes farmers uh, plant those trees. And so in a nutshell, we do have an opportunity because NDCs uh, are supposed to be re reviewed uh, next year, 2018, uh, to, to assess to what extent they're going to help us achieve that uh, uh, global level that is set out in, in Article 2.1a of the Paris Agreement. And hoping that with that assessment, the countries will be able to review their, uh, their NDCs with the hope of increasing the, the level of ambition. The second uh, area where you can, uh, you can now uh, start uh, taking advantage, uh, especially for scientists, is if you look at Article 4.19 of the, of the Paris Agreement, it, it requires that countries prepare mid-century long-term uh, low greenhouse gas emissions development strategies. Now, and the intention of that is it's, it's linked to the NDC because you have a long term and therefore every five years you're going to use the NDC uh, to achieve, to contribute towards achieving the, the mid-century. How many countries, you need now to start looking at what will be the role of agroforestry in this mid-century? Because if you mainstream that, then it becomes important as part of the policy shift that you are contributing and demonstrating the role of that. <laughs> then, then finally is of course the, the global stock taking, which is anticipated in uh, 2023. Uh, and, and again, uh, that is going to be very important because 
at that level also again countries are going to be required uh, to revise or to provide their next cycle of of ndcs and to, at that stage again you can now further you should have had enough new knowledge that helps you now to clarify how agroforestry should now be uh, elaborated in the next cycle of the NDCs. And as a consequence, you'll be actually mainstreaming agroforestry in the climate change uh, actions. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks, yeah, thanks a lot to, to, to Christian and to George. Really very useful thoughts. Maybe we ask uh, uh, our presenters to join them, and then we can go for another round of questions, comments, or discussions, please. Any thoughts, comments, questions? Yes, we have one at the back. Oh, three already? Charles is going to get to them. Can you through quickly so that we can start off? If you can, please be short so that we can get short responses and many more people can can ask. Yeah, hi there. My name is Janusz Stoppel from uh, Greenpeace. Um, one question uh, on, on this potential, very interesting um, presentation for now, and uh, you know, thank you very much. Um, my question is, um, there was a lot of talk about the potential of agroforestry in tropical uh, areas. Um, and to Mr. Grossheim, um, where do you see the potential for temperate zones as well? And uh, wouldn't it be through agroforestry also possible to actually increase ambitions in, in these um, areas. Um, and uh, just a short note, uh, tomorrow there'll be uh, an event on ecosystem restoration potential uh, in forest and uh, other ecosystems, um, also hosted by Greenpeace, um, Fern and uh, RFN for those who are interested in this subject uh, also further. Great, great. Next question, please, you, please just take note and then we'll come back to, to the panel. Please. Thank you very much. This question, uh, thank you for the expositions, and this is for the delegate of minister of German country. Uh, where we are, I mean, as indigenous people in this new perspective, because we are actors on the ground, we live there, and the policies they are talking on behalf of us. Sometimes we Indians, we are traveling the three borders, we have countries. That's our case, special case. But in solidarity, other local communities also, because I ask the question, or knowledge, or people, or rights. I mean, we have human rights and the river. The UNFCC, we're still fighting there. So my, that's my question, where we are as stakeholders and right holders. I mean, it's something that I can understand, maybe, <laughs> or I missed in the presentation. Thank you very much. Um, yes, he had a question, and then some in the middle, yeah? So we take. After that, then we go for another round after some quick responses. Yeah. Uh, thank you to all of you. It was, it is a very, very interesting topic and you are bringing too much uh, ideas and arguments that I, I'm now struggling how, how to come with my comment. <laughs> um, but it's, um, it is related to this, to this word, booth word, mainstreaming. I, I'm, I'm hearing this word coming from the from the climate change community, coming from the CBD community, and and, and others. And I'm very I'm very concerned about the direction of this mainstreaming, uh, which which bring me to the question: which uh, whose knowledge is considered when setting goals and setting metrics? In, in all these communities. And it's very related to what the, the colleagues are, are talking about because when we, when we approach to the, to the agriculture sector or the land use sector, let's say, it's different at the energy sector where you have some very, let's say, easy to, to, to characterize uh, and easy uh, actors or an easy to engage in a way which is very, which are actors that are um, that are common to be on on arenas discussing things and goals. But coming to the agriculture and land use, we are coming to a, a sector in in, in let's in, in the world which is very characterized by power asymmetries, by marginalization. Um, and 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 then and there is a plenty of cases and of examples of national can policies you, and actions. Wrap, can you wrap up, please? Yes, sorry. It's, yeah. it's, 
that that lead actually to uh, to more marginalization, etc. Then my, my my very question that was also in another panel is uh, it is there something new in in the climate change community or in these goals uh, that will avoid repeating the same things because because I'm I'm very I'm very um, concerned of this problem of of knowledge, who, which knowledge are are coming into these negotiations, into the goals, into the metrics, and uh, that's yeah. that's my my concern. Okay. Sorry for for Thank being okay. unclear. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, if I may, two short question, really short. Uh, one, just related to. Um, to, to the rate of return and and the other uh, well keyword is efficiency like we, we said when it comes to energy efficiency it's always clear but when it comes to agroforestry once I was told that by by our scientists that well if uh, let's say the biological production of, of a size of a land is considered one then the agroforestry can produce 1.4 can you this acknowledge by this fact I'm just this is a part of the question because well we also well heard that uh, the, the the food production is really important and out of these 1.4 <laughs> i was told that 0. 0.8 is just food and 0. 0.6 is wood so with that if, if we produce let's say agroforestry then we we cannot solve it with that respect in, in in replacing agriculture land we cannot solve with that respect the production of of more food is this really true with, in your experiences on one hand the, the other question is related to the to the wood part so it, it's really good that that it's uh, it's used for replacing fossil fuels and it saves all these times and efforts for uh, for uh, for ladies especially and, and children it's great uh, but I think that uh, not only uh, firewood can come out f out of this forest. There are honey farms, for instance. There are there are uh, harvested wood products. There are others that are, can still be commercialized. Do, do, do you consider all these when when it comes to to efficiency? Thank you. Maybe we start from Andrea on that side, yeah, and then we come this way for any quick responses. Yeah. Some of the questions. You can think on it if you miss. I can let you know. Okay, so I think the first questions uh, were not regarding our presentation. So, um, the um, one on the interest rate. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, you ask about the efficiency and the rate of return. Yes. Um, I think you always have to link the rate of return to risk and risk reduction. Um, maybe you can um, um, increase uh, the, the production of coffee and in these <laughs> terms get a higher rate of return, but you will have higher risk. And we will give an example for if you have less shadow trees, you have more soil, more sun in, in the aquaforestry system, maybe you get a higher production of coffee, but with less shadow, you also get more possibility with water scarcity and maybe you need more diversification. So you, you have to link both together. And this is maybe a very important point in this investment, how you can include this ecological and social return of, of risk reduction by um, investing in this in a more diverse aquaforce system, how you can calculate it, how you can take it into account. So maybe you um, avoid part of the efficiency and so you get um, a, a higher um, or better risk reduction and uh, a middle term of rate of return. I don't know if, if what's um, this is a response to question or okay. so maybe just um, regarding the same question um, when we started the project we thought um, 
or the it was the goal to find an um, innovative financing me mechanism and um, that have several income streams for the smallholders or for the the capital recipients to generate this financial return and what we then th saw is that that's always the same it's <laughs> selling um the main product and um maybe some um, carbon credits but th that's all and what we think is that there are potentials to um generate return also from aquaforestry for more products like honey um to use um, payments for ecosystem services and and so on there are more opportunities um, to, to um, increase the income, but they are not yet used. And that's something we also um, um, recognized. Okay, good. Um, Lalisa, there were the questions from European yes. potential and, and the one on yep. diversification of the systems, what comes out of it? Yes, uh, the temperate agroforestry, I think there is uh, an already ongoing movement. Uh, I think there will be a conference very soon on the same subject. I don't know when specifically it is going to be, but it's focusing on temperate agroforestry. It's not tropical, but temperate. Uh, there are some people whom I know, whom I can give you the contact if you want to engage with them. Uh, the other one on the efficiency side, I think what you are referring to is what is called the land equivalent ratio. And the big difference here, even though it is still food and wood, one thing is very crucial. It's not just about the amount of food. It's about the nutritional value of the food, which is more related to the diversification aspect. In agroforestry, that is the biggest opportunity because you have the spices, you have the different kinds of uh, crops or food items that you can get from these things, which complement especially the vitamins in the tropics. So it's not about the food security, it's not about the amount, it's about the nutritional security. How much does it contribute from a system level look the vitamins all the calories does it give the balance that we need and that's where the difference between the old version of food and the current context of food is different so even though it is still that food would kind of connotation there is a big difference and that's what i wanted to say yeah very quickly uh, which knowledge uh, I, it's a very serious issue. I agree. Uh, I think you you must have seen that uh, as we were negotiating the Paris Agreement, there was a tendency to shift from uh, top down to bottom up, uh, primarily to address that. And that's why in a, in every aspect we are emphasizing country-driven national circumstances. We are assuming that uh, the the negotiators coming from those countries. Uh, now negotiating the rule book right now uh, are taking into account the the the, the indigenous knowledge and uh, so that at, at the end of the day the because it is nationally reporting then it means they must take into account the national circumstances and particularly the indigenous knowledge uh, whether that is being done i i, I must agree with you that uh, we need a paradigm shift. We may we may not be very strong <laughs> right now, but I think I just want to encourage uh, uh, our other colleagues to make sure that uh, we we try to get the indigenous knowledge, uh, local and indigenous knowledge, into the policy process and also into the rule book that we are making in for 2018. Without that, uh, again, we'll be we'll be top down. So that's the intention. Uh, I know Christian will talk about uh, CBD. But I remember when I used to still do CBD, there was something called Article 8J. Uh, it still is. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I know that I've domesticated it, for example, in the Kenyan laws. Uh, and, and therefore, it, it deals a lot with the indigenous uh, and the prior informed consent. Uh, it, it's, it's a well embedded uh, principle. And uh, Christian may, may, may elaborate. Well, thanks. Um, on the agroforestry, agroforestry issue, uh, I hope there is room for agroforestry systems in temporal zones. I'm not an expert 
on agroforestry in, in temperate zones. We have a, a publication on that. I'm afraid it's in German anyway. I can uh, give you the link if, if you like. Um, on the role of the indigenous peoples, um, yes, I'm fully aware of that. Um, the thing is, a lot of money is pouring into uh, these natural assets. This, is, this was on the first slide uh, uh, Thorsten showed. And the question is, do we have the potential to direct it somehow, to, be, to make it uh, more, uh, or, or to, to direct it more to sustainable uses, to make a better social impact, and to pick up the recipients of the money where they are standing. So this is the, the question, and this was one of the uh, main issues when we started this project uh, with O Verde and the Global Nature Fund. And I think we are uh, somehow on the way to to make it better. I'm not saying we have the solution here, but uh, at least it, it's it's on the list. It's uh, in our mind, and we are not forgetting it. Um, and on the issue of mainstreaming, uh, I share your concerns. However, these are uh, all uh, always in this in this negotiation context. They say it's a question of national sovereignty. Um, we have these are all not legally binding issues. What we are discussing, and neither the Paris Agreement is. And uh, uh, it's up to the countries what they are making out of it. I mean, it's not the EU telling the rest of the world how it works. It's not the rest of the world telling the EU how things should work. And uh, it's the national sovereignty. And uh, we hear that every time when we talk to NGOs and, and social society. Um, but it's, it's, it's a question that needs to be solved on the national level. I, I'm, I'm afraid I have no better answer to it. Um. Thanks a lot. I think I think these are really, really useful things that we've talked about. I think France is really moving towards the path of having an agroforestry policy in, in Europe, actually, with recognition that there is a lot of potential in that in that direction. But I think there are lots of questions. I think what we've heard here today is there is some potential, really good potential. There is some finance coming in. There are questions around how we manage that, how we take opportunity of that, who wins and who loses. We have to be aware of that in this case for it to make sense. Uh, we've also learned that there are big challenges in terms of how we actually measure what we are delivering in terms of climate change, in terms of impact, you know, and how we measure what, what, we, what is going into the system. Um, and there are big issues about around also uh, uh, building resilience and how we measure those those issues, but also big issues around looking at who really benefits and who really loses in these dynamics of the financing coming in, the process through which it goes, and what impact it brings. But I think we've raised the question sufficiently, and I think there is sufficient room for us to think through this as we move forward. I'm sure in December we will come up with uh, another session where we will try to specifically address some of these these issues in December um, in, 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 in another side event, because there are some things that we've worked on, that we've touched on, that we might come back to. But for now, I think I'd like to us to give a big hand to our presenters and our panelists <laughs> for a wonderful job, and for ourselves for making it such a good and, 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 and discursive event. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.